Hello, good morning and welcome to the briefing here. It's the 27th of September and as you can see Anthony Chung is not with us so you're going to be stuck with me this week to make sure you're up to speed on all things macro. So straight into it because as you can see here um, we've been locked in on the German uh, elections over the weekend and we have got a result of sorts um, except don't get too excited because we're probably not going to have a German government formed for probably well who knows could be months yet and I'll explain why now because here are the results with the SPD party just sneaking it with a 25.7% um, of the vote which does mean of course that Angela Merkel's party that's the CDU party there uh, coming in at 24.1%. I mean, for Merkel's party, just to put it into context, as you can see, a massive swing in terms of losing minus 8.9%. And 24.1% for the CDU party is the worst uh, result in a national election in its entire history. So as Merkel is swanning off into the sunset, having led the country for 16 years, um, looks like she's not leaving her party in, in any good position and looks like they're going to be out of power. However, we'll see how this goes because the SPDs have sneaked it. But look, obviously no one's anywhere near a, uh, an outright majority. So we're definitely having a coalition. And if you're up to speed on your German politics, then it's all about it was well, the debate was Jamaican coalition or is it going to be the traffic light co coalition and, and basically this was talking where the Greens and the FPD party those two parties would definitely be the junior members in the broad government coalition it was just down to who would be the big brother and would it be SPD or would it be CDU and for now the SPD have sneaked it the the colors of the three parties making up then the, the Jamaica coalition would have been CDU with the Greens and the FPDPs and, and and obviously traffic light is SPD so with the SPD I mean this is Olaf Scholz who's the leader there, definitely the most popular of the two candidates from the big parties, I would say. Um, Armin Laschet uh, of the CDU party, Merkel's kind of replacement, has, uh, has just been a bit uninteresting, not particularly inspiring in terms of uh, as a character. Um, so certainly Schultz here, I would say, is the front runner, although in the kind of aftermath of the election in the early hours of this morning, Lachette is still insisting that they're, they're potentially in the running because what happens now is these parties need to negotiate to try and form a coalition. Normally what happens is the lead party, the person, the party that gets the most votes, then has the first right to attempt to form a coalition. But of course, there's some big differences in policy between these parties. And so can the SPD form a coalition with the Greens and with the FDP party um, and we're going to see in the weeks ahead and it may be that they fail to agree in which case there is still an angle for the CDU party to come in and then be given a mandate to try themselves but the point is that this German election whilst it's over in terms of the voting it's really only just beginning and markets aren't particularly responsive to this this morning I mean I'll go across and we'll have a look at the DAX chart here you've had a little pop to the upside you might say that the SPD party may be a marginally more market favourites, um, but there's not too much in it. And anyway, there's not much market reaction simply by view of the fact that, that we're not expecting a result here in a government being formed for maybe months. So that's what's on the ticket for the weeks ahead. It's how are these negotiations going between these parties and ultimately what's the government going to look like when, when actually it does ever get formed. I mean, obviously this is a big turning point, a big moment for Germany from a political point of view. Merkel has been in charge, as I said, for 16 years, putting her as the third ever longest um, chancellor of the German um, nation. But, you know, I'd say kind of Merkel's sort of, let's call it comfortable and cautious uh, style of politics has probably meant that there's been perhaps underinvestment in a lot of things 
related to the German economy over the last sort of 15 years while she's been in power. And so there's a there's a lot to kind of pick up on. And, you know, through no fault of Merkel's, I think her term will be remembered for crisis management rather than, you know, economic and political reform and really modernising and pushing the nation forward. It's been about dealing with the financial crisis. Then we had the Eurozone debt crisis. Then we had the refugee crisis. Then we had the coronavirus pandemic. I mean, to be fair to Merkel, it's been one after the other. And she has been a safe pair of hands through a crisis. But I'd say they probably slipped into that mindset of kind of crisis management has become that substitute for initiative um, and kind of investment. So, you know, they've been very sluggish to reform their pension system, for example. And this is what we should be expecting the SPD leader now, Schultz, to be kind of pushing on um, and setting out agendas to reform that pension system. Obviously, Germany got an aging population. And so that's a concern. Um, they're a bit, they've been sluggish on the climate change front. They don't spend enough on defense and, and X, Y, Z. OK, so there's lots to come here. But from the even though the, the headlines are all about German election this morning, I don't think the markets are particularly interested. We have a look at the euro here, which has come off a little bit, I guess, but we've just broken down below um, the low point that we had Friday afternoon. So just a little bit of a technical move. Not hard. Look, look we've, moved, we've when I say moved down, we've, we've dropped sort of 20, 30 pips here. So given we've had a, a national election, this movement isn't really um, of any note whatsoever. We're kind of just eyeing up that low point that we had um, back last week down at around the 117 handlers, the kind of key technical for that euro. Um, but yep, so the German election is is done. I mean, let's, let's just kind of step back, I guess, because we'll, we'll come back and have a look at the euro because I want to talk about what's ahead this week. And certainly one of the big things is um, the ECB uh, Sintra forum. Uh, this is the ECB's forum on central banking. It's like the ECB's Jackson Hole, uh, if you like. Um, but before we do that, let's just take a look around markets and we'll have a look at the general mood and the vibe here. This is looking at US uh, stocks. This is the S&P 500. And as you, as you can see, um, overnight through the Asian session, we've been tickling higher and we've now pushed up and moved above that high point that we had um, last week. Um, if we just quickly move to a daily chart here, you can see we've got a little bit of work to do in terms of getting back to the all-time highs that were set back on the 3rd of September. If I just draw a line in there, you know, that's upper right. Just, you know, we did move above that 4,500 handle for a few days, for about a week or so. Then that really the momentum, just look at the number of dojis through here, indicating that that momentum to the upside was was really running out of steam. And then we've come off, of course, and we sold off off the back of Evergrande. And, but as we were talking about in the podcast last week, that's kind of, you know, the S&P's recovered the sort of, let's just call it the Evergrande sell-off. And now we're kind of back to square one. And it's kind of, where do we go from here this week? And whilst, yes, we're, you know, positive sentiment here this morning, um, you know, without, you know, getting too excited about anything, but it may be that we kind of now see this S&P just push on towards the, the kind of upper end of this range and that being up above the 4500 handle and we just check in on the nasdaq because the nasdaq very similar pattern here of course with the high all-time highs back at the start of september and then the evergrand sell-off and we kind of recovered that so these two markets they started the week reasonably positively other than the german election stuff not too much to really discuss on the sort of international front by way of uh major major moves i mean obviously here in the uk from a domestic point of view we just drill in and have a look at the pound here uh, let me zoom in on a slightly shorter term um, lots of i mean if you're in the uk then been a bit chaotic over the weekend with massive queues outside petrol stations as the nation panics that we're going to run out of of petrol and this is all due to a, a hgv lorry driver shortage and you know, it is turning into a bit of an emergency. Whilst, you know, fuel supplies perhaps weren't anything to get worried about, they kind of are now because everyone's panicked and bought all the oil, uh, sorry, all the petrol. So uh, Boris Johnson thinking about emergency measures about bringing in the army and the military. Uh, he's, he's kind of waiving visas um, on the, you know, to get uh, people from outside the country to come in and drive these lorries. And so it's been a little bit of a uh, 
uh, a funny weekend on that front. But as you can see here from the value of the pounds point of view, you know, we've opened pretty much where we closed on Friday. We came off a little bit during Friday's session, but actually markets don't really care. So it's one of those things that whilst you're out there on the streets, you know, in the economic system, if you like, and you're seeing stuff happen and you're like, wow, OK, this is something weird's kicking off here. But but actually, from an economic point at this moment in time, at least um, not too much concern. Now, of course, we need to monitor that. You know, can the government implement some emergency action to make sure that petrol stations don't run out? Well, obviously, we'll see. But at the moment, markets are reasonably sanguine to that. But if 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 we do have a, a fuel crisis, then obviously this will start to have a genuine negative economic impact. But it's only ever likely going to be very short term and maybe won't happen anyway. So for now, markets are reasonably calm. Um, the other thing then to talk about is what's going on this week. And actually, let me just bring up the um, the, the weekly calendar. Um, and we just can have a look through and we can talk through and I'll come back to the charts in a second. I'll just increase the size of that for you. Um, so here we go today. With, with regards to today, it's probably the least interesting from a kind of data point of view. You've got some money supply figures out of Europe. Um, right, right now, as I speak, actually, these are hitting the wires, but not. I don't think these will have any impact. Not much from the US this afternoon either. These data releases, durable goods, never really moves the needle. Um, you've got Lagarde talking, but you know what's going to happen this week is got we've got a huge amount of monetary policy speak, and this is because of the Sintra uh, forum, which is due to kick off tomorrow, by the way. So we'll see. We'll get a text release um, on this today at twelve forty-five. Um, well, that's from her parliament. Sorry, this is Lagarde talking at the European Parliament Economic Committee, I should say. Um, but I would say she's going to probably hold back. It'll be interesting to see what's in this text release. But she's giving a big speech tomorrow to really open that Sintra uh, conference. Um, and what are we expecting her to say tomorrow? I mean... She's been quite vocal in recent weeks. So she was on CNBC last week and she said that volatility in energy prices could persist for longer than um, existing COVID related supply issues. Uh, so just perhaps hinting towards how she expects maybe that inflationary situation to be less transitory than we had originally hoped. Um, she went on then, uh, then uh, she, she was... Um, in a press conference um, on the last ECB meeting back on the 9th of September, she said that the euro area economic rebound was, an, was in an increasingly advanced stage. And output is set to exceed pre-pandemic levels by the end of this year. Um, she was talking about how, you know, whilst we got a reasonably upbeat, and I, and I guess this is one of the interesting things at her, her speech at the start of the Sintra conference. She used, she used that opening um, speech last year to to definitely cover an economic update and it'll be you know interesting to hear certainly there's some positive noises about Europe I was talking on the podcast a couple of weeks back about how um, Morgan Stanley particularly have gone quite bullish on Europe they're expecting Europe to outperform the US and that's just because Europe are a little bit behind the US from that COVID recovery perspective so whilst the US have gone through that accelerated rebound post unlocking uh, mainland Europe haven't really had the full stint of that yet. So we are expecting an acceleration in growth in Europe. And then when you're looking at the valuations between things like European stocks and US stocks, well, actually, they're at the largest ever divergence uh, with Europe looking cheap and the US looking expensive. Um, also, you're getting a nice tasty yield on European stocks these days of north of 3% if you're looking at the Euro stock 600. And when you compare that to a German Bund yielding minus two that's a five percent spread there which is again a record high and that's that that delivers real value in the equity space so um, it'll be interesting to see how upbeat Lagarde is about quarter four and of course going into 2022 and whether that marries together or not with that view of, of people getting a little bit more or, or having a bias towards Europe with regards to stock asset allocation you know, rather than the US, which is looking overvalued a little bit. Um, we'll see also, we want to hear about how they're going to be winding down their PEP program. This is the ECB, that the PEP program was the pandemic emergency purchase program. So obviously, as we come through the back end of that lockdown phase, then clearly 
it's time to step that down. And what we want to hear is how will they, you know, return back to their asset purchase program, you know, in order to bolster, you know, what is the kind of infancy of that kind of economic post COVID economic rebound. So it'll be PEP, winding down PEP. What does that mean for the APP program? Um, And last year, um, Lagarde at this Sintra forum, she did use it as a platform to definitely talk about policy. Um, so we're expecting possible, you know, interesting comments from her. Also, it's not just Lagarde either. And actually, if I if I skim down, sorry, and let's have a look um, into uh, where are we? Tuesday session, and and, and this will be when the uh, Sintra conference starts on Tuesday. Uh, let me just scroll down, so you can see here we've got a load of um, news that are expected around about 2 p.m. Okay, so that will be the time to kind of get onto the news wires and see what's going on. But this is a two-day conference, um, and it's not just, as I said, uh, not just Lagarde that's talking. We'll also have a panel discussion. It's the, the, the most heavyweight monetary policy panel you can possibly imagine, because on the panel will be ECB's Lagarde, will be Fed Chair Jerome Powell, will be Bank of Japan Governor Kuroda, will be Bank of England Governor Bailey. So you got the kind of the, the, the four the big guns, if you like. Now, that sounds really exciting. And wow, we might get some fireworks and we might get some really interesting comments and maybe markets are going to be volatile. But I just kind of rein in that expectation because these guys lined up on this panel last year and they didn't really use it as a platform to talk about their own individual policy specifically. Um, but you never know, right? So we've got to be make sure we're monitoring news wires through this week when it comes to um, all things Sintra and, and monetary policy. Um, let's go back to the charts here. Now let's have a look at the let's have a look at the, the commodity complex um, because you certainly need to be keeping your eyes on crude oil. So what's happened overnight? Well, we've ticked on and we've ticked higher. And this has been a, a theme certainly over the last few weeks, as you can see. Uh, let me just draw that line in from, from Friday's high there that we've taken out technically. And this has taken us up and kicked us up above 75 bucks very briefly, just tailing off a little bit. So another step higher. It looks like this upward trend uh, has legs to go. The really important thing about this move, from a technical point of view at least, is we're right up here testing the July highs. And also importantly is looking back at the very long term chart 2015. So we're, we're up above the 2015 highs up here as well. And, you know, technically, this is quite important, I'd say. And if, you know, we do get the continuation of COVID fears reducing, for example, case numbers in India over the weekend were announced at the lowest levels we've seen for six months. So really positive kind of trends, downward trends starting to form in in some of these, you know, hugely populous areas. Um, So if that happens through quarter four, then on the demand side, things might pick up a little bit. Um, And this could well help to push oil onwards and upwards. And, you know, as I said, technically, we're at really key areas here. Um, the summer's high around here, the 2015 highs, and we can push up above, let's say, 75.50 and sustain that, then really, you know, you're kind of starting to look up to numbers like $80 even, which are kind of price points we haven't seen for years. Um, So, you know, expect this to feed through quite positively to the energy sector stocks, for example. So keep an eye on oil that's broken again higher and continues this upward uh, trend. Uh, Gold's been a funny one. Um, and it's been a bit lackluster, um, even during the Evergrande events last week. Gold really didn't take much interest to that, um, and it kind of is just languishing around that 1750 area this morning. Um, if I go to a daily chart, you can see it in a bit more broader context. We had a big sell-off uh, back at the start of August, but that kind of then stabilised. And what what's been a great kind of resistance area was, was that kind of triple top that we had in in July and then into the start of August, and that really capped the upside of this rebound that we saw. So that September high, bang on those levels. So really powerful sort of technical area here around 1837. Um, so that held firm when we kind of drifted off. 
Um, but yeah, gold's kind of been drifting to the downside. We'll see. I mean, if we flick back and have a look at the euro dollar, then the dollar's been strong, of course, which, which certainly is one of the key things that's driving that gold price or keeping it under pressure and preventing it from moving higher off any of these kind of safe haven events like Evergrande. Um, and whilst we're here on this euro, you know, do make sure you're aware of these technicals. The low we had in August at 16, uh, 116.80, Six is key. We managed to kind of just stay above that all of last week, although flirting with it on a couple of occasions. So just keep an eye on that today. And obviously, when we go through into the Sintra events uh, with Lagarde's opening comments, then obviously the euro is, of course, potentially sensitive uh, to any of that. Um, what else is going on then this week? If we flick back to the calendar, we've got data-wise U.S. consumer confidence figures that are coming at Tuesday afternoon at 3 p.m. in amongst all the monetary policy speak. You can see Lagarde there is at 1 o'clock uh, live. Um, Beyond the pandemic, the future of monetary policy is the title of her speech. So that will be the key kind of moment, I guess, for the conference, as well as then that panel discussion with all the kind of big uh, central bank speakers uh, coming together. So, yeah, lots of ECB chat. Lots of Fed chat. Um, also, Yellen may be talking about debt ceiling issues. So that's going to start to rumble on. Um, concern, of course, that we might go through another debt ceiling crisis episode like we did um, a few years back. Um, so certainly expect to hear more from Janet Yellen um, in the coming weeks. And that will all come to the head, to a head, you know, towards the middle to end of October. OK, so we all, all are, that that will become a bigger and bigger issue. But as a few years back, it's an issue that will get resolved and so may cause some short-term worry, but ultimately shouldn't have too much of a long-term impact. Now, if we scoot through to Wednesday um, and have a look down here, we've got some data coming out of the Eurozone with consumer sentiment and consumer confidence. And then, yeah, the other big thing is then uh, Japan and, and Japanese politics. It's not just Germany that are changing leaders. Uh, or indeed changing a party, even in Germany. Uh, in Japan, it's just changing leaders for now. Uh, Suga's stepping down. His, uh, well, his, his popularity rating post-COVID collapsed, and so he decided to fall on his own sword, resign, step aside. So we've got a, um, a party leadership uh, race. It's expected to be a, a guy called Taro Kono. Uh, he's the front runner. And he's the most popular out there amongst the public, at least. Uh, he's quite an interesting figure, very experienced. Um, interestingly, he speaks fluent English, um, studied at uh, university in the US. He's a former defense minister, for, former foreign affairs minister. Um, so, you know, incredibly experienced and, and certainly on paper would, would fit the job very nicely. In terms of his policy stance, well, he would probably... Well, he said in the past that Japan cannot change monetary policy radically uh, due to the pandemic hit uh, to the economy, of course. Japan, uh, again, a little bit behind the West in terms of um, their recovery from COVID and unlocking. You'll remember this from how it impacted the Olympics, of course. In terms of his tax side, he said we must offer, offer tax exemptions to companies that boost distribution of wealth to workers. Well, any, any new kind of ideas on stimulus packages... He said that the focus would be on prioritizing 5G and renewable energy. Um, so that's uh, that's coming uh, on. So we should we should hear results from the Japanese elections. Uh, sorry, yeah, the Japanese leadership race. This is there's then actually a general election in November. So even though this isn't uh, a kind of general election for prime minister, uh, ironically, it probably whoever wins this leadership race will become the prime minister because they're, they become the leader of the, the dominant political party in Japan. So it's a pseudo general election in a way. Um, <coughs> excuse me. So as you can see here, look, plenty of uh, mon mon monetary policy overload uh, this week, pretty much every day. Um, and Powell and Lagarde and Karuda and Bailey, they'll be on that uh, panel, as I said. That's kicking off at 4.45 uh, London time. Uh, on Wednesday, so make sure you're glued in on that. You never know. I'm not expecting big fireworks from there, but you have to be tuned in just in case. Uh, scooting through to Thursday, things start to get a bit more punchy on the economic data side here. Past Sintra now, that'll be behind us, and now it's squarely China. Um, and we've got some key manufacturing figures 
coming out of China. Of course, concern about how the latest kind of Delta uh, impact, Delta variant impact has kind of just slowed and damaged Chinese growth momentum. Um, obviously, we've had the Evergrande saga, which is still rumbling on, by the way. Um, and clearly, that's knocked confidence and sentiment. And certainly, people got huge amounts of wealth tied up in property, and they're really worried about prices now. And obviously, this is going to impact their 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 their, their desire to get out and consume as a consumer. So certainly, some as we head into the back end of 2021, China's definitely becoming the biggest concern from an overall economic perspective. And obviously, Evergrande being that kind of key headline story that encapsulates all of that. But we've seen figures out of China worsening. And so, you know, we want to see if that worsening trend on the data front is going to continue or not. So really important data out of China on Thursday morning. Uh, probably topping that bill is, yeah, here, the Cayenne manufacturing PMI, which dropped below 50 last month, and it's expected to stay below 50. Um, but it'll be interested. It is expected to recover marginally from last month. But any number, let's say, below 48.8 this month, dare I say below 48, and then really it'll continue to stoke those concerns um, about China. And then moving down, um, uh, we, yeah, we've also got some key um, unemployment figures out of Germany, UK GDP figures as well. Um, unemployment data. Then, yeah, on, on Thursday afternoon, we got German CPI figures, which will be key because if when I scroll down um, US GDP figures, this is the final reading for quarter two, though, so no real interest here in terms of that moving markets. Chicago PMI might be of interest. But what will feed through, obviously, more speakers, but into Friday's session, uh, the big Tankan surveys out of Japan, that are always important. Um, but yeah, the big figure kind of from from the um, Eurozone and Germany will be the final uh, kind of PMI readings here. But the key one is going to be this, uh, the European uh, flash uh, inflation print. Um, we're expecting it um, at 3.3%. If I just show you the chart, what's happening but it's a bit delayed, as I said. Europe's been lagging. The US has been lagging the UK in terms of COVID recovery. And that certainly is the case for this inflation spike as well. So whilst the US had this kind of inflation spike began a few months back, and we've maybe even seen the peak of that, and it's coming back down again, the UK have gone through the, the beginnings of that inflation spike. But we're similarly here, the Europe, we're expecting it to step up again here. And so obviously this will you know, shape potentially Lagarde's comments. So it'll be interesting to see what she thinks about this. Unfortunately, Sintra is coming just before um, this data. We're expecting inflation to again push higher, but they'll be uh, wanting to stress it's transitory, of course, um, and, and trying to, you know, calm markets. So that inflation figure out of Europe at 10 a.m. on Friday is really important. And then we got the core PCE readings and we got the manufacturing, ISM manufacturing figures out of the US on Friday afternoon as well. So some, some important um, data sets here, um, you know, at the end of the week. So really just to kind of wrap then, I guess, it's, it's kind of mainly a monetary policy focused um, first part of the week, all eyes on Sintra. Then it shifts to China in terms of data um, on Thursday morning and then key inflation data out of Europe on Friday morning and then some, some big figures out of the US on Friday afternoon. Okay, so that's the week ahead. Um, enjoy. That's it for today's briefing. Thanks a lot.